it is. Yeah, I can't pull a Jill. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, quick, quick housekeeping thing. Um, the evaluation, they were gonna, they wanted an evaluation on how the class was. So if we just uh, fill that out before you leave and we could just um, leave them here on this table right over here. Um, that's fine. Uh, this is a quick evaluation and how it went. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So, welcome to um, Identity and Destiny, Session 6. When Destiny Meets Destination. So, here is what I was talking about. Again, my name is Michael, for those that don't know me. Welcome. Thank welcome. you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, catching Session 6 is. We're, we're a little we're a little ways down the road, but just so you know, if you do go to YouTube and do the search on identity to destiny, you will find the previous five Thank lessons. You. Thank you so much. On YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah. So if you go to YouTube and do identity to destiny, you will find the previous five sessions. And so the the plan is that we will not have a class next week, but. The week after that, we will start up with part two, and we'll be going through it again. You'll be keeping the same handouts. Um, we're going to go, because as you remember, when we went through the first time, we only went part way through each session. So we got a lot of catching up to do through all that, and I've decided that when I do teach this again, I'm going to make the back-to-back. -back. Session one will be two weeks in a row. Session two will be two weeks in a row. Instead of separate them out like this. Go ahead. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Just fire it up. Come on in. Oh, thank you. All right. You want to sit right there? You got some paperwork right there. You want to have a seat right there? Sure. Welcome. Welcome. Glad you're here. Hope. And I was just telling everybody, because we have some new people over here, too, that, um, that if you go online or go to YouTube, Identity to Destiny, you can find the previous five sessions. And then we're going to not have class next week, but the week after that, we're going to start with session six, or with session seven, which is going back through session one, but there was a lot that was missed out on because it's so much. It's a 12 week course, it really is. There's no way around that. Uh, it's just too much. So, should we bring our. Yeah, bring all your, bring your handouts. Yeah, bring your handouts and your notes from the first classes back with you. Get a little folder to keep them in, and just that way you uh, you always got them with you, and now we can keep adding to them as we go through them. Because when you go back and refer to them, it's like, oh, that's yeah. what that meant. Yeah. It's more refreshing to them. Yeah. Looking forward to that. So last week, I said this. I, remember, I couldn't remember exactly the quote. When the child is healed, the adult is changed. And that's actually me. That's that's my quote from so I put Michael. Because that looks like you. It does look like you, doesn't it? No, I just I just signed it and then Jill goes, Well, it's not your signature without your smiley face, because I always do that on everything. I've been doing that since I was in high school. And it still does. But when the child is healed, the adult is changed. It's this, it's this I'm not. So you knit together in your mother's womb, and then and then life happens, and years go by, and and these, this life just continues to happen and it hurts and all that. And the more PTSDs just continue and continue and continue with the I am not. But what we don't realize is that there was something that happened clear back here early in our, in our life. You know, two years old, something. It could have happened in the womb. It could have been your, your life starts to record from uh, conception. It starts to record. It records. It hears out. When you're in the womb, you're still hearing things. You're still recognizing voices. So if, if your parents had conversation about not wanting you while you were still in the womb, guess what? You heard that. Whether you remember it or not, you heard that. And so it's it's a mark on your, on your uh, recording, the vinyl of your soul, what I call it, right? There's a mark on there. So we always try to fix the adult. We're trying to fix things out here on our adult cycle of our adult <laughs> life. And we keep falling back into our old habits and routines and behaviors. Why? 
because we're trying to fix something out here externally that still has a root problem back here at the start of our startup. So when we come back in here and we get healing back in here, that root begins to affect things all the way through and all of a sudden, and it could be six months, we start to see a change in our behavior. And we don't know what happens. We don't know why it's starting to change. But there became a healing back in here. Our childhood, our child began to get healed. And so the adult is changed. We've got to stop trying to change the adults. And let's go back and start healing the child. Healing that child in here. We, that's why the prisons are so full. That's why addiction and overdose is so bad. Because we keep trying to do external solutions to the internal problem. And the healing comes from this right here. Out of the, your innermost being is flowing rivers of living water. That's where the healing comes from. Right there. It doesn't come from any place else, but right there is where it comes from. Out of your innermost being. We are so afraid. Let me tell you this. We are so afraid of all of our crap. We never want to deal with our crap. But you know what? you got to go through your crap to get to where the Holy Spirit is working out of you. Deeper in you than your crap is the Holy Spirit. See, I know there's a, there's a famous preaching message out there that uh, says it goes something like this. You are a piece of dung covered in snow. You are a white, snow-covered piece of dung. That's a lie. That's not who you are. Your innermost being is the Holy Spirit, not crap, not scubula, we to put it in Greek, not the scubula. So you are a diamond that's been covered in crap. So let's go back to your center. Let's go back to your core being and start allowing the Holy Spirit to bring healing to the child and start changing your adult. Start changing your adult. I walked that trail so many days with looking for the healing, asking for the healing. And I began, when I began walking, I began asking, show me where that is. Show me where that is in here to heal it. And then I began to realize that I don't need to see what caused the hurt. I don't need to see it. Sometimes we look at it and now we're mesmerized by that and go, and now we have a pity party. I can't believe I went through that. Wow, I forgot about that. I didn't even realize that that had happened to me. Poor me, look what happened to me. Now, what are we focused on? We're focused on this hurt. Mm -hmm. How is it going to get gone if we're focused on it? Because what you focus on, remember, what you focus on, you become with, one with. So when we start focusing on that hurt, we are one with that hurt again, and that hurt just continues on. And just we just keep our cycle. We just keep our cycle. So, I began to walk and say, I don't need to know where the hurt is or what caused it. Just heal it. Every time I would find myself reacting to something and then going, oh, why did I do that? Why was I upset about that? Why did that bother me? Why was I hurt by that person's reaction? Why did that person cut me off? Why am I so upset about that? What is it? Every time I would find myself reacting to something that I later went, why? If I'm saying why, that means in here somewhere is a child that got hurt by something. You are not important. So when somebody cuts me off, what they're doing, or drives slow in traffic, this is my worst one, but they're driving slow in traffic, and I got some place to be, and I hear myself saying it, I got places to be, you know? And I'm thinking, don't you know how important I gotta get there, you know? And, and, and so I'm constantly doing that battle. Still doing with what is it in me that says that I am not important. And see, this person driving slow in front of me, they don't appreciate. See, they're proven that they don't think I'm important. Otherwise, they would go as fast as I need them to go to get me where I want to get. Right? It's, that's so subtle. But it's so real. It's so real. This is life-changing stuff. I am telling you, this is life-changing stuff. Okay, you guys ready to get started with class? <laughs> yeah. What you Welcome. What's your name? Chris. Chris. How you doing, Chris? Absolutely where I belong. All right. My name's Michael, and uh, 
I've been running through this class, and a uh, quick update is that this is five years worth of walking this and figuring it out and then cramming it into 12 weeks. Um, that's what it, this, this is. So I go on wild rides, hang on, it'll be fine. All right. So everybody got a handout? Mm -hmm. Session six. When destiny meets destination. Remember, destination is the place you end up. Destiny is the path you take getting there. So you have two handouts. One of them is called footnotes, a single page. We'll be referring to that at times. I just wanted to throw that in there because there's some stuff we're gonna be looking at. And then your actual handout is four pages. So that's what we're gonna be reading from now. So remember, destination is the place you end up Destiny is the path you take getting there. Identity always takes us to destiny. When you have the wrong identity because of stuff going on here, I am not, it causes you to take a path that is not your true destiny towards the destination. Wrong identity, wrong path. True identity, true, true, your true identity, you will be on your true path towards your destination. I talked to so many guys in prison about that same thing. And then here's what I would always tell them. I said, if you're not where you want to be, and look where they're sitting, right? If you're not where you want to be, it's because you're wearing the wrong identity. Because they're not being who they truly are. They're being what society told them, what their uncle told them, what some relative told them, what they thought they were supposed to be. And that's not who they are. And so often, when they would start to discover, going through that Bible study, they start to discover the true identity, they would get out of prison. Before they put in for it, they get out early. Because their true identity began to show up. So Father God had to take them out and put them on their true path. So they can get back on the path they're supposed to be on. We all have a path towards our destination. We just got to get in tune with our true identity, our true DNA, divine nature attributes. That's your DNA. The core of your being is divine. The Holy Spirit. I will put eternity in their hearts. The core of your being is the Holy Spirit. Remember when we did Trinity of Trinities? The core of the center of you is the spirit, and then your soul, and then the body. Three, three, three. All right. Skip the class or we... Uh, Can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, the core there, is that... Uh, they're talking about the conscious? That yeah, we're talking, uh, yeah, yeah. If you're, ta if you're talking about meditation stuff, yeah, that's the conscious self there. Is that that's, that's the Holy Spirit, the conscious self. Yeah. yeah. That's my conscience, and that's where the fiery darts come. Things that uh, it dreams and things that make you angry. Uh, that's in here. That's in your soul. Okay. What this is in here, that's the Holy Spirit. Okay. But I thought you were referring to a, a meditation term when they say that when you're operating in this, you're actually operating in unconsciousness. Okay. You're going through things because it's just a reaction. It's an unconscious it's reaction to something. Okay. And then when you get into here, you start being conscious about what, what's going on. You start responding instead of reacting. So that's what I was thought you were referring to. So yeah, that is, that is, that is consciousness. Okay. This is unconsciousness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That was a quick little lesson. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. All right. Let's do. Let's do some reading here. <sighs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, uh, <ooh>, uh. <laughs> All right. Revelation two seventeen. It uh, English Standard Version. Yeah. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers. I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no, that no one knows except the one who receives it. That white stone, that's what y'all have. Y'all have the stones. I'll give you all these stones as a reminder. If you are here, when you're here for part two of this session, we're going to see a transformation happen. But so these white stones, these are just a reminder of your true identity. So these you can... Carry with you, you can put them on your, I don't care. It's whatever you want to do. It's just your reminder, do whatever you want to do it. So that's the white stone. So where it says white stone, white doesn't really 
describe it, but they don't know how to describe it. It has to do with a brilliance, a brightness, a light. So he gives a, a light, a bright stone to, uh, with a new name written on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. So I've, I've talked about identity, and I've heard people come and, and start quoting all kinds of scripture to me about their identity in God, you know, who, what God calls them. That's not what this is talking about. Because what this is talking about, what this new name is talking about, is the name. It says right there, no one knows except the one who receives it. You know what that tells me? It's not written in a book. You're not going to read it in a book anywhere. This is a name that comes to you that only you and Papa know. But is it only the ones who will receive that stone with that name are people who are in the book? Uh, could be. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, just Mark, we were going over this in John last night. Oh, the really? The book well, about name changes and how Jesus changed the names of his disciples and how he gave them new names like Peter. You know, yeah, the rock. Yeah. You know, and throughout the Bible, God gave people new names. Sarai, he named Sarah. Abram, he named Abraham. And what did those names represent? I don't know. Well, if we go to, if we go to Sarai, to, to Sarah, that name change has to do with, with becoming a mother of nations. Okay. So, so Abram went to Abraham, Abraham, which is a father. So they got their name, and that put them on their destiny. It okay. changed their identity. Yeah. No longer were they on this path, now they were on this path. They were, this was the destiny now they were walking towards their destination. They were still heading towards their destination. Now they're on the path that they're supposed to be walking on. Yeah, so a, a name change is a good thing. When we get to part two going through this, <coughs> eight weeks from now, whatever that is, we are going to see some serious things that happened to Jacob who became Israel. And we're going to take a look at that story in detail about what happened. And it is so powerful what happened when Jacob became Israel. It's powerful. So what I want you to pick up here to this is that hear what the Spirit is saying. What the Spirit is saying. It's what the Spirit is saying. It's not coming from an outside source. It's coming from the Spirit. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Um, I have a question again. When you say Spirit, are you talking about the Word of God? I'm talking about Father, Son, and Spirit. The Trinity? Yes. I have a problem with that. Uh, could you allow me to elaborate? Okay. Why is there two thrones in heaven? One is for the Father and the other one is for the Son. It, uh, These aren't physical thrones, though. You know that, right? Yes. Okay. The thing about it is, uh, uh, God's got an imagination. He uh, he forms uh, whatever he decides to build and create. He's got an imagination. He builds it in his mind, and once he's got it perfected in his mind, then he speaks it into existence. So. In creation in Genesis chapter 1 and God said that word is very important okay. said means that he spoke something what was it that he said the first thing that there be light so that's where uh, I have a misunderstanding on on the Trinity God is one not God three, is one not three persons God one. is one so, God, God is one, but they are also three, but they are one. And the, the, the natural mind cannot comprehend that. That's why it says, let him hear what the Spirit says. you got to right. hear what the Spirit says, and we don't understand. That's why he says, no one knows except the one who receives it. There is hidden manna. He talks about hidden manna, and we're getting ready to look into that too. Word. And that is, that is stuff that cannot be comprehended with the human brain. It can't be comprehended. It has to be trusted in yeah, what the Spirit is doing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the, the Word was God. In the beginning was the 
Word, and the Word was face to face with God. They were face to face in the beginning. Come, let us make man in our image. There's more than one if it's an us and an our. So we have to understand that in the beginning, there was a father, there was a son, a Christ, a son, and there was a spirit. And then us make man, mankind, in our image. And in our likeness, male and female, he made them. So even as far as male and female, the us and the our are male and female because they were made in the us and the our image. It's a long, it's a long conversation. <laughs> yeah, and we could do some side conversation if you'd like. Okay. 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 So, let, hear what the Spirit is saying. The hidden man. He said to the churches, the one who conquers or overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. Manna. You look up that word in the original language. Manna is what? Word. It's, it's what? It's whatness. What? It means what? what? You, you look up that word, that's what they said. They said, what is this? When they talked about the manna. What? They didn't know what it was. They didn't have a name. They didn't know how to explain what it was. When he talks about the hidden manna, He's talking about spiritual things that can't be explained. Yeah. It can't be explained. The hidden manna are the secret things that can't be explained in our human words by our human minds. That's why we have to hear what the Spirit is saying and not listen according to influences that are trying to tell us how we're supposed to. We need to hear what's going on here. Last week, I talked about the face-to-face. -face. I said it's in this face-to-face. -face. When we are in face-to-face -face relationship with Father God, when we are sitting in this relationship, that's when the revelation happens. In this, it's transforming our every cell of our being in this face-to-face. -face. What happened in the garden? They had a face-to-face -face relationship with God and then they turned to the tree, to eat from the tree. Their identity was attacked. You are not like God. But you can be if you just buy this little product right here. I have this for sale. And you can be everything you need to be if you just bought this. It's all through our media. Everywhere. So that tree is what started the whole I am not but I can be if. Because they were already like God. They were already made in his image and his likeness. And the accuser came and said, well, no, you're not. But you can be if you purchase this product or if you eat this fruit or if you do this, then you can be. And she turned. She turned to the tree. And she looked at it and it says and she saw that it was pleasing to the eye and good for knowledge. And so she ate. Because she was in a face-to-face -face and she turned to the tree. And what you focus on, you become one with. And that's what she did. And then that's when humanity fell at that time and went into darkness. And we are wandering around blind as bats. And we don't see. And we filter everything through our I am not. I am not important. I'm not good. And we filter. It's like sonar that goes out. And everything that we filter, like I keep saying, it's, it's our glasses. We don't know, we can't see our glasses, but everything we see changes when we have the glasses on. Sunglasses, I don't care what it is. You put glasses on, you don't see the glasses, but everything you see after that, you put on blue glasses, everything's blue. Pink glasses, everything's pink. It changes your view of everything. That's what the I am not to do. That's what happened in the garden. So. This hidden manna, what is the hidden manna? Hidden manna is a concealed whatness. The best way to describe it. It's the, huh? It's the, what just, what was that? What just happened? You ever have those like, yeah. what? Yeah, concealed manna, where you just can't explain it. <laughs> and you know how much Papa loves that. The fact that you keep coming back and going, what? <laughs> is that? Yeah! Because no one can do it like I can. No one can explain what I can do. Far and above all that you can ask or what? Imagine. It's beyond your imagination. 
what he can do and what he does. Hidden manna. So valuable. But hear what the Spirit says. The hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. No one knows your true <coughs> name except for you and Papa. No one knows it except for you and Papa. And it only comes one way. It only comes, and by the time we get to part two of this, it's really going to be explained. It only comes here, right here. This face-to-face, -face, face to face no agenda. You've got to take your agenda. You've got to take this list of things. You've got to take this checklist of what needs accomplished in you, what needs accomplished in the world. You've got to take this prayer list. You've got to take this, and you have to put it down. Because what's going on, as long as this is in my hand, I am not focused here. Well, I can turn here, but guess what? My view is blocked. I have to put that down and just be open. It says we, with unveiled faces, are being changed from glory to glory. Not being changed by what we've read. Not being changed by how much scripture we've memorized. We are being changed with unveiled faces. We, with, we with unveiled faces faces are being changed. The change happens in the unveiled face-to-face -face relationship. It happens. Nobody can take it from you because nobody gave it to you except for the Father. No one so, can take that from you. So we, the change is basically our conscience seen through the unconscious. So like we are living that I am nots is all the unconscious stuff. Yes, the unconscious us. behavior we go through. And that's the stuff that we're looking through now. That's the filter that we're but trying when to go we through. Become, when God starts to change us and we start to change from within, we become conscious. We become conscious of God, a Father, everywhere we look. Yes. We begin to see him in all of his creation. Not just where we think he is, because we know that he's supposed to be there. Because I've read the book that says this is where he hangs out. Or I've seen on TV where they had this great move of God at this building or at this church or in this city. So I know if I go there, he's going to be there. But he's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And when we start spending time here in this face-to-face -face change of glory, we begin to see him that he's in my car when I get in there. Yep. He, he's, he's wherever I go. I begin to see him in the faces and that's of the people. And that's Even the people possible. that flip us off. <laughs> that's how it's possible for us to love them. That's right. <laughs> it's impossible to love them without, without that. that. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, good stuff. Well, doesn't he come to live in our heart? That's what this yeah. is. Yeah. That is yeah. that. That's your innermost being. That that's is your things. innermost being. Yes, that's the things. throne. He set his yeah. throne up in your heart. Yes. That's where he dwells. We're not looking for him over there. We see him everywhere. And because he's right here. He set up his throne right here. Makes sense. That's it. That's where his, his reign is. What do we see here? <laughs> yeah, you got <laughs> So, hidden manna is that. Concealed whatness. The mystery hidden. Okay, let's go. Okay, let's go to um, our footnotes. First Corinthians, because we're talking about the hidden manna, right? We're going to focus on hidden manna for a minute. First Corinthians, it's in our in your footnotes on the sheet, that plain piece of paper. Okay. First Corinthians two six through ten. This is the Passion translation. Thank you. However, there is a wisdom that we continually speak of when we are among the spiritually mature. Who's he talking to? The spiritually mature. It's wisdom that didn't originate in this present age, nor did it come from the rulers this age, who are in the process of being dethroned. Instead, we continually speak of this wonderful wisdom that comes from God, hidden before now in a mystery. Sounds like hidden manna to me. It is His secret plan, destined before the ages to bring us 
into glory, to bring us into this face to face. None of the rulers of this present world understood it. For if they had, they never would have crucified the Lord of shining glory. This is why scriptures say, things never discovered or heard of before, things beyond our ability to imagine, these are the many things God has in store for all of his lovers. But God now unveils these profound realities to us by the Spirit. How? By the Spirit. Not in a book. By a Spirit. By a face-to-face -face encounter with Him. By a Spirit. Yes, He has revealed to us His inmost heart and deepest mysteries through the Holy Spirit who constantly explores all things. So, what the book will do is it will confirm things that He's showing you. He will show you in this face-to-face. -face. And then you're going to read it in the Scriptures and go, it's right there. How come I never saw that before? How come I never recognized that before? When this face-to-face -face thing became a reality to me, Everywhere I look in Scripture now, I see face-to-face, face-to-face, it's face-to-face. He's always talking about a face-to-face -face relationship. Always, always, always. That's the mystery he came to reveal. That it's all about getting what even Adam did in the garden of turning to turn back to a face-to-face. -to, -face. to turn back to a face-to-face. -face. How do you get to recognize the voice, the, the Spirit? Practice, practice, practice. Trial and error, fall down, read scripture, spend time sitting in the presence, and you just don't, and what it is is you just keep seeking the truth. As long as you are seeking the truth, even if you get off track, the truth is always going to bring you back to the truth. Because the truth, the truth wants you to find the truth. So the truth will always bring you back to the truth. But if you're looking for truth so I can fix my answers and pat my answers and go, yep, I was right, I knew it, see right here it is. Now you're caught up in pride, now you're caught up in selfishness. And so you can get stuck there. But if you're searching for truth, and that's why I say all the time, take your truths and hold them like this. Because as soon as you start clinging on, you can start being misled because just because you find the truth, you have not found the whole truth. The whole truth is way bigger than you can ask or imagine. We just read it. So it's way big. If you go, yep, there it is. Got it. Got it. Now, that is in your lift in, in the Bible that he'll reveal all mysteries in that day. I mean, we will in the scripture and we'll get into it, maybe if we get that far enough, that um and it's not until part two. We'll get into it where he says, Then I knew partly, but now I know fully, even as I am fully known. Yeah. That's in this face-to-face. -face. And when we get to that verse, look at it again. Start looking at it. It talks about a face-to-face. -face. When we are in a face-to-face, -face, then I knew, but now I know even as I am fully known, we start having this reflection, this mirror that begins to happen as our face-to-face -face with Father God. Powerful stuff that is life-changing, but we get so caught up on these external things and we're missing out on this internal thing that changes things, that really changes things. Mm -hmm. You know why the Ten Commandments never worked? Because they were an external solution to an internal problem. You cannot fix internal problem with an external solution. It can't fight its way through the crap. Yeah. That's why Jesus had to come. To get in here to work from the inside out. Where it is a forever change. Alright, let's keep going. The way, the truth, the life. The way, the truth, the life. Colossians. Same, we're still going through footnotes for two more verses. Colossians 1, 25-29. Uh, expanded Bible. So this is a little bit further with a little bit extra footnote stuff in there. Don't limit yourself to one translation. Go through them, go through them, go through them, go through them. And you'll see a little bit of variations. And then you start saying, pulling them all together to find out what they say. Because some of them leave this out, some of them leave that out, some of them add this a little bit. And if you go through multiple translations, 
Well, somewhere in the middle of all of that is the truth that you can start finding. So don't get limited to one. So here's the expanded Bible. I became a servant, a minister of the church, because God gave me a special work to do, stewardship or commission, that helps you, for you. And that work is to tell fully or complete or preach everywhere, fulfill the message or the word of God. This message is the secret mystery, something God had not previously disclosed in Ephesians 1.9, and we'll look at that later, that was hidden from everyone since the beginning of time. Ages and generations. Sounds like hidden men and stuff. But now it is made known to God's holy people, the saints. God decided, chose and willed to let His people know this glorious, a rich and glorious secret mystery, which He has for all people, the nations and the Gentiles. This secret mystery is that Christ lives in you. Right here. Here's the secret mystery that's been hidden, that is now revealed, that Christ lives in you. We're still chasing things out here. We're still looking for kingdoms over there. Kingdoms inside you. The secret mystery is that Christ lives in you. He is our only hope for glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we continue to preach or proclaim and announce Christ to each person using all wisdom to warn, instruct, and admonish and to teach everyone in order to bring each one into God's presence as a mature person in Christ. To become mature. To become mature. We have to be changed to become mature. To do this, I work, toil and labor, this is Paul talking, and struggle using Christ, His great strength that works so powerfully, where? In me. me. In me. It works in me. Where is His power working? In me. His power is working in you. But in. With Paul, when he was on the road to Damascus, he got knocked off his high horse and went blind. He had to go blind before he could see. Because he had to stop seeing with his eyes so he could start seeing with his heart and his spirit. He had to go blind to see. And then he talks later on, I think it's in Ephesians, he talks about how um, the Father, Father God, who set me apart from my mother's womb, was pleased to reveal His Son. And it, said, it doesn't say to me, was pleased to reveal His Son in me. In me. In me. In me. This is where the revealing happens. This is where the change happens. This is where the transformation happens. It has to happen here. We get so caught up in do, 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 and we are called to be beings. We are beings. So be. Not do. You're not a do. You're not a doing. You're a being. <laughs> Put a couple of you together and you're do, do. <laughs> uh, okay, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. So I was going to ask, so everybody's in a mission then? Yes. And the, the biggest mission is to transform myself in a face-to-face. -face. I can't help you if I don't know this face-to-face -face myself. Otherwise, I'm just telling you a method. I'm telling you a tradition. I'm telling you something to try and do. You know, if you roll the dice and it lands on seven, then, yep, yeah, now it's going to happen for you. You know, I can tell you a method to do, but doesn't that method doesn't change here. This here only changes one's place. Right here. Right here. It's in that face-to-face. -face. It's in that intercession. It's in that time alone. It's in that quietness. How busy are our minds? Always running rampant with thoughts and stuff and worries and fears and anxieties and, and everything. And so what do we do? We turn to addictive stuff to try and shut the mind down. But we turn to this. See, that shuts the mind down. That's knowing God. This out here is knowing how. God. That's right. Yeah. So if I tried to tell you a method, I could tell you a method on how to get to know about God. Mm -hmm. But this is knowing God. Very good. All right, Ephesians 1, 9 through 10, Passion Translation. 
And through the revelation of the anointed one, he unveiled his secret desires to us. The hidden mystery of his long-range plan, which he was delighted to implement from the very beginning of time. And because of God's unfailing purpose, this detailed plan will reign supreme through every period of time until the fulfillment of all the ages finally re reaches its climax. When God makes all things new in all of heaven and earth through Jesus Christ. Here's the footnote that was in there. As translated from the Aramaic, the Greek text states, God will gather together all things in fulfillment in Christ. That is, God will unite all things under the headship of Christ. Amen. It is all about union and unity and oneness. When I stop focusing on trying to change people and I focus on oneness with the Spirit in me and the Father and get that oneness, then it changes everybody else. John 17, 20, that prayer that Jesus prayed before he went and faced the cross, that last recorded prayer in the upper room with his disciples, that intimate time. John 17, 20 through 26, he said, Father, I pray not just for these that are gathered here in this room. I pray for those that will believe in me through their message. Amen. That message that they carried out of that room, you're sitting in this room Amen. because you believed it. That's right. So that prayer was for you. Jesus prayed for you when he was walking terra firma. What was that prayer? He said, Father, Father, I pray that they will be one, even as we are one. Amen. I in you and they in me, may they be brought to complete unity. And then here's the kicker. Here's the word that does it. Then the world will know that you sent me. We're so focused on trying to convince the world that he came, and we're not spending time here developing union. And so that's why 40,000 denominations, or 30,000, or whatever it is, and the most divided religion there is, because we're so busy trying to say, well, nope, I've got the truth, and, and you're missing out on it, because if you don't believe it, that's like I believe, because there's only two beliefs in the world. My belief and the wrong belief. Right. Dude, what did you say? There's only two beliefs in the world. There's my belief and the wrong belief. Yeah. That's typically what we believe. Okay. But there's only one truth. There's just 40,000 determinations of what that truth is. Yeah. 30, 40,000 variations of what that truth is. Guesses. Guesses of what that <laughs> truth is. That's why hidden this, manna. this, the hidden manna, that's why this, if this face-to-face -face becomes your reality, the world changes. And it's not you going and telling them, it's your very presence around them that begins to change them. Exactly. I just spent a weekend in prison on a, sitting on a table with just the presence of God in me that was beginning to minister and transform these hardened criminals right in front of my eyes over the weekend incredible time of watching that transformation and it wasn't because of these great words that I spoke to him it was my presence and my I'm not going to judge you by anything I'm gonna treat you like a human being by the end of that weekend they were saying I felt like a human being this weekend I wasn't a number I was a human being when you treat people like human beings then the humanness in them becomes a reality in their life and they stop acting like animals. Helps them heal. Yeah. Brings that healing. Praise God. Okay. This, man, time goes by too fast with you guys. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Yeah, we're back into our four-page uh, thing now. We're going to leave that in a verse for later. It comes up later. Okay. So this is when destiny meets destination and dwells there. This is it. This is it. This is when your destiny meets your destination and dwells there. When your path comes to your destination and dwells there. John 17, 20, 20 23 or 24 or 25, right in there. Jesus prayed, but he's still praying. And he said, Father, I pray that they may be where I am. What's interesting, he said, where I am, not where I'm going. He said, where I am. He was in the upper room with them before he went to the cross. 
He said, Father, I pray that they be where I am. Where was he? He was right here. Before he went to the cross. He was right here. And he said, Father, bring them to this relationship. That's why he was without blemish. He's talking about unity. Always right there. Yeah. Unity and yeah. unity so that everyone will be saying the same thing. That we the only know. way that can happen, there's only one way that can happen. It's not getting a bunch of churches to agree on anything. Exactly. It's right here. Right there. Because when this happens, my heart, I only say what I hear my father saying. I only do what I see my father doing. And if you're doing it, and you're doing it, you're doing it exactly right here. And you're only doing what you see your father doing. And you're only saying what you see your father saying. Guess what? We're all doing the same thing. We are in unity without trying to make it into unity. Come on. And then the Amen. world looks and goes, oh, Jesus was real. The Christ did come. It's true. Amen. Then the world will know. You guys are getting it. I told you this is a life-changing thing here. All right, let's go back to uh, back here. When destiny meets destination and dwells there. Now, I'm getting ready to get some quotes. And they're not exact quotes. They are paraphrased quotes um, from George MacDonald. This book is a monster masterpiece. He is uh, uh, Irish, 1700, 1750. Um, C.S. Lewis, you guys know C.S. Lewis? C.S. Lewis calls him his master. Yes. C.S. Lewis was in a bus station waiting for a bus, saw one of his fantasy books, one of George MacDonald's fantasy books, picked it up, it was called um, Fantasies, is what it was called, picked it up and read it, and couldn't put it down, and then was reading it some more, and through that, that became, began C.S. Lewis' journey towards Christianity and writing fantasy, Christian and spiritual fantasy books. George MacDonald was doing it in the 1700s. He was doing that. And then he was, he was a uh, Methodist preacher for a while. And then, um, but he couldn't just do the Methodist preaching. He had so many questions that he was looking for and finding answers that they, the leadership, didn't agree with. And so what they did is, uh, funny story, is uh, he had like 11 kids, but... Um, they came to him, the, the, uh, the leadership, they had a vote to get him in. That's part of the, the way they do it. And there was like 60 people that voted him to come in and be the preacher. And then about 20 or 30 of the leadership, about 20 of the leadership came to him and said, you know what, we're going to have to cut your pay. And what they were trying to do was make him quit. You know, if we cut your pay, you'll just quit. And then we don't have to fire you. Then it's a good thing. And they came to him and said, we're going to have to cut your pay. And he said, all right. It'll be slim, but we'll do it. Okay. Because he wouldn't leave. He wouldn't leave. He knew. And then they came and said, no, no, no. Actually, what we're trying to do is get rid of you. Um, we're just wanting to fire you and get rid of you. And he said, listen, 60 of you voted to get me in here. Unless 60 vote to get me out, I'm not leaving. So then he, the next year, on less wages, he made 11 kids, you know, trying to make it survive. And he did it. And then finally, after that year, they still didn't have a vote. They tried to get a vote together, couldn't get it. And then finally, he just moved on to the next thing and went to the next town. And so he has, it's called unspoken sermons. Because there are sermons that he never had a chance to speak, but he was a writer. And he did the, the circuit. He came to the Americas and did the traveling circuit and, and was preaching and powerful, powerful, powerful stuff. And it's outside the box, for sure. So, these aren't exact quotes, these are paraphrases. But back to our uh, lesson here. So I just want to give you a little George McDonald background. Um, this here is, here is a paraphrase from that book. This white stone is not a voting pebble, representing whether a person has made it or not. But rather, it is a vehicle used to represent the passing of the name given to an individual. It is the communication of Abba, Thinks what, of what the communication of Abba thinks about the person to the person. It is the expression of communion between the two. That is why it is personal. A true name is one which expresses the character, the nature, the being, the meaning of the person who bears it. It is the person's own symbol, the person's sole picture in a word, the sign which belongs to that individual and no other. 
God alone can give this name, for God alone knows what the person is or can see the sum and harmony of what the person is becoming. God alone can give you your true name. So this isn't a voting pebble, like I've heard some saying, well, that means you made it. You get this pebble because you made it. No, you get this pebble because Papa's trying to express to you, I am giving you your name. And now here's something tangible that you can grasp onto to say, there I am. That's my true identity. That's my name. Only Papa can give it to you. That means nobody else can take it from you. And if it is, it is this, this name, this hidden man, and this new name, go back up there to that verse, which that no one knows except the one who receives it. No one else knows your name. And let me tell you, no one else gets your name. No one else can take your place. You are your only you in your relationship with Papa. And the stuff that he talks to you about, no one else is going to understand what he talks to you about. Mm -hmm. It is a unique, individual relationship of one-on-one, -on -one, face to face and most, I don't say that. A lot of people are afraid of turning you loose with just spending time in the face to face. Because what that means is I no longer have control of how you see God. Now you are finding your relationship with God. It's not about me as a preacher or whatever I am. It's turning you loose in your relationship and saying, Papa, they're your kids. They're not mine. They screw up. It's your fault, not mine. You know, let them go. Let them go explore. Let them go look for truth. But what if they get off track? Good. They're going to learn from that. They'll learn from getting off track and they'll learn to get back on track. I heard something this last week about a woman said about going through the door and Lieutenant, I know I've done this. I'm trying to go through this doorway, but I'm trying to take my family with me. Uh, yeah. But we can't fit through no. the doorway because it's only meant for one to yes. get through at a time. Only. So I have to leave my family back here to have that yes. there. And when I have that there, they see that. And, and then, then you can come back and share. And then they will be drawn to this. Be drawn? Yes. Because yeah. not because you can tell them about it, but because the I am in you, the presence, the presence in you will draw the I am in there, in them. We're not here, we're not to that place yet, but I'm going to talk about the magnet, because we'll get there eventually. The magnet, it's like this. I need this. It's you're, two magnets. You ever try and put the opposite ends of two magnets together, or the same end, and they, they repel each other? You know that, they repel each other? And then you put the true end to each other, and they... They slam towards each other. Well, here, this magnet and this magnet are both doing opposite things. This internal magnet is drawing you to this face to face. This soul magnet is repelling and trying to turn away. It can't. Soul. The paradox is you are being drawn at the same time you're trying to turn away. At the same time, it's, it's like, I can't. I can't. I can't do that. I can't face that. And we're afraid to face it. We find excuses to not do it. And But inside of us, it keeps pulling us. It's like um, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will drag all mankind to me. You guys ever been fishing? And you set the drag on your reel, and you catch one. And if it starts fighting, you let some of the drag out. It takes off. It's not off the hook. It's just running free. And you let it wear itself out. And it slows down, and then you start running in some more. It starts fighting. You just <laughs> let the drag go. Let them go. Let them wear themselves out. And then finally, you get them in, and they're so worn out, they're glad to be up on the shore. Yeah. They're like, I'm gone. <laughs> That's why he said, if I be lifted up, I will drag all mankind to me. You may find yourself playing for a while, thinking you're getting away, but the hook is already set. Yeah. The hook yeah. is already set right here. Yeah. You're just fighting because you think you can get away, but you're not getting away. Where are you going to go inside of this relationship? If all creation is here, 
inside of this because apart from him, nothing has been made that can be made. Seen, unseen, doesn't matter. It's all inside of this relationship. Father, Son, Spirit, inside. It's like a snow globe. Where can you go when you're inside of a snow globe? Nowhere. Nowhere. You are in. You are hooked. He's just going to play with you for a while. Let you wear yourself out. How did Jesus defeat death? By submitting to it. How does he defeat our ego? By submitting to it. He just loosens the drag and lets us run. Oh, you're so awesome. Look at how cool you are out there. <laughs> and then you start getting tired. He goes, okay, let's bring you in a little bit. And you start getting tired. And he starts bringing you in a little bit. And then you realize, wait a minute. He's drawing me closer to him. You <laughs> take off. And then the next thing you know, you're like two feet from shore. And you didn't even realize, how did I get this close to him? Mm. It's just because he is constantly, this magnet is constantly pulling you to this face-to-face. -face. Mm. And then this constantly wants to be fighting against it and go. And pretty soon, this comes <coughs> up. And that magnet just keeps pulling you. And you find yourself getting closer, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, inch and an inch. In. Okay. To so love is to be obedient. Say what? I said to love is to be obedient. That's right. But it's learned. Yeah. We learn to obey because we don't trust Him. Yeah. Obedience comes in two ways. Either through fear or through love. Yeah. And so, at first, we fear. But we're not made perfect in fear. Perfect love <coughs> pass out fear. Because in fear, we are never brought to perfection. We will always be not perfect. But in love, love is what brings us to perfection. So, we start off in fear, and then we mean because it's just not it. And then there grows to be this love that begins to start happening. And perfection begins to start happening. And change, and healing starts to come in. And this healing starts to happen, which creates more love. Love is given, but trust is earned. And so we learn to trust Him. And when we learn to trust Him, we learn to be obedient. Yes. We obedient. learn to be obedient through the trust. And that line brings Him into short. That's right. That's right. Okay. Let's keep rolling. Time just flies. The Ionots are the names given by the accuser, Satan is the accuser, and his fellow accusers. They are false identities. Only a person's true father can give a person their true identity. Only a father that sees what is hidden in the depths of that person's being knows who they truly are. Why is the name only given when the person overcomes? That's the George McDonald question right there. It continues on. Does God not know what that person will be from the time he knits them together in their mother's womb? Yes. Yes. But just as repentance comes because God pardons, yet the person becomes aware of the pardon only in the repentance, so it is with the name. Only when the person becomes their name do they recognize and understand what their name signifies. It is the blossom, the perfection, the completion that determines the name. Such a name cannot be given until the person is the name. So, Papa knows who you are, but you don't. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my little footnote there. Papa knows who you are, but you don't. And until you know who you are, you don't get the stone. He's drawing you into that. He's bringing you into perfection. Papa knows who you are, but you don't. We live out our lives in the false identity. We live out our lives with this false identity. Papa knows from in here, who you are. He knows who He created you to be. He knows your DNA, your divine nature attributes. He knows you all the way, but you don't. You don't know who you are. And then we try to memorize Scripture or whatever that says, this is who I am. But then we read it, but then we don't believe it. We read it and we don't believe it. But when you spend time here in this face-to-face, -face, it's not about whether you believe it. It just starts changing you. So you begin to know who you are. You begin to realize you are changed. You become changed and start walking and becoming your name. You, that's interesting. You become your name. You become your name. Okay. 
We think we think that that name should be perfection, but perfection according to whose standards? So here we are. Each name is personal and uniquely represents a person's individual relationship to Abba. It's a personal, personal, individual relationship. No one else has your name. It's not listed in Scripture or written in a book. It's the name only you can hear when He calls you. Coming out of your innermost being, telling you that you are His. You are His expression to the world. His inspiration to creation. That's the name that He gives you. You become His expression to the rest of humanity. You become how He expresses His love to the rest of humanity. But that becomes manifestation. Yes, that's the manifestation of who you are. That's right. Okay, go back to your footnotes. The one-page footnote. Second Corinthians. We're going to read this one now. Because he talks about you are his expression to the world, his inspiration to creation. Second Corinthians 3, 1 through 4, Passion Translation. We are beginning to sound like those who are we, beginning to sound like those who speak highly of themselves. Do you really need letters of recommendation to validate our ministry like others do? Do we really need your letter of endorsement? Of course not. For your very lives are our letters of recommendation, permanently engraved on our hearts, recognized and read by everybody. As a result of our ministry, you are living letters written by Christ. Not with me, but by the Spirit of the living God. Not carved out into stone tablets, but on the tablets of tender hearts. We carry this confidence in our hearts because of our union with Christ Thank before you, God. Thank you. So, you become that living expression that others see of Father's love. You become that. That's your name. All right, here we are uh, down there. Right hand side. We are all wandering through the darkness of future trips and past regrets. We're back to our four page thing. I'm sorry. I shifted the pages. And... Didn't you guys see me put it down over here? You don't have to pay attention to me. I got it. I was talking to my wife. Oh. <laughs> tell, her, tell her to pay attention. <laughs> Norty. Norty. We are all wandering through the darkness of future trips and past regrets. Tripping over our fear and our anxiety. Longing to hear our Father call our name. The loving shout of our name from our Father brings hope and security. It tells us, I am safe now. I am home. This is why the message of separation that is continually being preached throughout the world is so damaging. That you are separate. That you are separate from God. You are separate. You are out there. That message, I wish more people understood 1 John 1 through 3. Understood this, what John was trying to say, that there's not anything out here trying to get inside that relationship. You were created inside this relationship. This is where you are. Because that message is separation. And let me tell you what happens. And when we go through, uh, when we get to part two, I start talking about trusting this father. And we don't trust that father because we think that father is going to abandon us. Again, we're going to think he's abandoned us again like he's already done. That's why we don't trust him. That's why we constantly go, who's got my back? Has anybody got my back? Am I going to defend, defend myself? That's what happens with the I am not. We start defending ourselves because we don't know he's got us. We don't trust him he's got us. We start trying to figure it out on our own to make it happen instead of just trusting him. Ma, would you allow me to elaborate on something here? Okay. On separation. When Jesus was in the garden, he was praying, and he said to the Father, Father, if there's another way of doing this, let's do it, but nonetheless, your will be done. Okay. He was trying to avoid something. What do you say he was trying to avoid? The pain of going through the cross. No. The, the thing that he avoided was talking about it's just before he passed away. He didn't get separated. Right. I, can, I can argue with you right there. Wait he didn't minute. get separated. Hear me out. I okay. ask you to hear me. Okay. Okay. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Yes. That was the breath of life. Yes. But the other thing was his soul. And that's when God cannot look upon sin. 
or be anywhere oh. around sin. No, I disagree. Okay, let me finish. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. and when he, that's when Jesus, God turned his back on Jesus. I disagree. And, and that's when God, Jesus cried out, Why hast thou forsaken that was me? That Psalms 22. Okay. And Not, then he yeah. says that he went into the bowels of the earth. Yes. And that's what you're, you're getting out of, what I'm getting out of you is that separation from God is what you're saying here. And, and it didn't happen. It did not happen. He was quoting Psalms 22. If you read Psalms 22, that's, that is the prophecy on the cross. He was quoting that. Now, if, 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 he couldn't, if God couldn't look at sin, that makes sin more powerful than God. Uh, pardon me? If God cannot, Father God cannot look at sin, that makes sin more powerful than God. Because now, if he has to turn his back because of sin, sin just keeps chasing him around everywhere. Because if he can't look at it, sin's more powerful. No now, man. here's the other thing, too. When he came in the garden, and Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, right? The original, right? That's when it happened. That's when the fall happened. And they said, we hid from you because we were naked. What did he say? Oh, my God, I can't even look at you. I can't look at your sin. No. He said, who told you you were naked? He was looking right at him. If he didn't turn his back on Adam, why would he turn his back on his son on the cross? Because he was covered with our sins. This is the same sin. Our sin is Adam's sin. Yeah. It's the same sin. You don't have a different sin than what Adam had. It's the exact same sin. That's where it came into being. It's there. And there was no separation. That's Psalm 22. But that's the lie that's been going around saying he turned his back. And because he can't look at sin... You are always in trouble. And now the always, the back of your mind, there's this fear. What if he turns his back again? Well, but he can never turn his back because sin has no power over him. He don't. He don't have it. But why do we have to renew the mind? Because we think that we are bound into the sin. Same. We don't realize that Jesus came and changed all that. Then God has to renew his mind. No. No. It says, it says in, in Corinthians that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He wasn't reconciling himself to the world. He wasn't changing them so that he could change. He changed them to turn back to him because they wouldn't face him. Well, they said she was deceived, uh, uh, deceived by Satan that she would be like God. No right from wrong. Uh, no sin. She found out about sin and God does not know he's not the creator of sin. Uh, sin has always existed. Sin, sin, hamartea. It's hamartea. It's, it's hamartea. It's what it is. And, and it, it's, it's ha, ha, which is a negative. Every time there's a ha, it's a negative. It's not. It means not. Yeah. And martea has to do with focus or aim. Remember we say sin is missing the mark. Okay. It's missing the aim. It's missing the aim. It's not seeing. So sin is not seeing the truth. Okay, you mentioned the magnet. Yes. You uh, turn the opposite of the magnet, it repels each other. Right. So that's what God does. He repels no. sin. No, we repel from God. We're the ones that are turning from God. God is trying to draw us from us. If, if God could look, not look at sin, then sin would constantly be chasing God all over the universe. Because sin would be more powerful. Sin is more powerful. If I, if, you, if I have something that you can't look at, if you can't look at it, all I'm going to do is just keep showing it to you, and you have to keep turning from me. Well, uh, it says uh, that's what's wrong with uh, the human race. There's so much distraction that our uh, attention spans not over three seconds. Right. And, uh, and God cannot look upon sin. I think uh, I appreciate your... Your, uh, your boldness. Okay, thank you. I really do. All right. But uh, Jesus... Just wrestle with it. 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 Jesus said very clearly that nothing, nothing impure will ever enter heaven. If God has... Who calls it impure? Who's the one that names it impure? Jesus named it. No, who names it impure? He said nothing impure will enter heaven, but we're the ones trying to say what's impure. You know what that is? That's eating from the knowledge of good and evil. Yes, exactly. That's when we eat from that tree, then we're calling things. And what did, what did God tell Peter when he was up on the top of the building praying up from his house? 
and that whole that sheet, that sheet uh, came down with all those unclean animals. He said, take and eat. And Peter, being a good Jew, said, I will never eat anything unclean. And what did God say? He Do not call something unclean clean. that I have called I clean. Yeah. So we continue to call things unclean that he hasn't called unclean. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, it's like, how do we know? We don't. We just have to trust Him. Because He said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Never will I abandon you. Well, if they've got sin and He can't look at it, then He has to abandon them. He has to leave them if He can't look at it. So that's the lie of separation that keeps us running from God instead of running to God. Well, those were the exact words that Jesus said. Why hast thou forsaken right. me? That's Psalms 22. Read Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Psalms Michael, I, John. Should I suggest that let's get on with your okay. teaching and you can talk we have this conversation. on the side. All right. So good. Finish your good, good, good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Oh, so, yeah, the lie of separation is so damaging. Okay, page two. Mm -hmm. All right. We had a good one, didn't we? <laughs> it was good. Appreciate it. We all long to hear our Father call our name. But we have been trained to fear him with his wrath, anger, and judgment, so we hide. We hide in our darkness of shame, fearing he will find us clothed with our ugly nakedness, and then shame us more in front of all creation. We will never sit in a face-to-face -face if we are afraid of him. Afraid of him smacking us down. We will never sit there. You will never sit there without hiding behind your fig leaves. Adam and Eve did that, right? Hid behind their fig leaves. You will never sit there without an agenda if you're afraid of him. Never. You never face what you're afraid of. We always run from it or try and fight it. So we have to get to that point of not being afraid that he's going to abandon us or reject us. If we fear he's going to reject us, we will not turn to face him. I just heard this morning a testimony about a grandfather and his granddaughter, his little granddaughter. And she was getting ready to get into something that she was not supposed to be into because it was going to hurt her. He immediately yelled her name. And it sounded really harsh. He yelled her name. But she didn't run from him. She stopped, turned towards him, ran and hugged his leg. So he saved her from harm because she wasn't afraid of him. When Father God yells our name, he's wanting us to run to him for protection, not from him into more damage. But we have to trust him. That was it. His granddaughter trusted him and loved him and knew that he loved her so she could run to him without fear. If we have fear, we won't face him. So we, we, all, we know the Father's love. Father is love. So what? Exactly. There's no fear. Exactly. There's no fear. There's no the fear because the Father is love. God is God love. Is love. Well, is it something He does? No, it is Him. It's who He is, yes. and that's that's right. where we learn the trust. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. Is that mm -hmm. we learn we learn that trust because before I come run to the Father with my problems, I always tried to solve them myself because mm -hmm. I was afraid that I wasn't worthy. Of right, the Father. Right. You know? So it's like, okay, well, I've done these sinful things. Um, I can't look at Him, but the whole time He's looking at me, and I'm the one that was running from Him. Yep. So I see how that. I see. Yes. That. Yeah. But we got to remember, Christ died. Yeah. He took all our he sins. He took it all. Yes. Our but sins. I didn't know that then. You know. Yeah. It was told to me, but I didn't know you it. You didn't know it. I'm yeah. learning it. <laughs> learning right. it. It's yeah. learned. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We learn to trust. That's why I said love is given. Trust is earned. Trust yeah. is learned. We learn to trust. All right. Um, it is vastly more important to know Papa's character than to believe what he can do. He is a good Papa to all of his kids. He will never shame you. And then Genesis, we could read that about the fall and what happened. And they were naked and ashamed, so they hid. Instead of they hid behind their fig leaves, instead of turning to him and just running back to him, they tried to hide from him. They turned their face and hid because of the shame. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Who told you that? I didn't tell you that. You told yourself that. And now you're hiding because 
That's how you see yourself. I see you the same way you were. You see yourself different. Mm -hmm. You see yourself being shamed and full of shame and fear. I don't see you that way. That's what he told Adam. That's what he told Eve. You see yourself. The I am not. I am not loved by Father God. I am not loved. I am not important. I need to hide in my shame. I am not. Began right there in the garden. And they've been passed down every single generation since then. And now it runs rapid through our media. You know, buy a big, bigger car. Need a bigger car. Need a new and improved. Got to have the new and improved one. Got to have it. Well, it's only six months old, but there's a new and improved one that's going to make me feel better because the way this one made me feel when I first got it, I don't feel that way anymore. So I need to go and get a new one so I can feel that feeling again. It's like I heard, uh, I heard one guy say, if it was supposed to satisfy you and you're buying another one, it must not be doing its job because you're still not satisfied. So that's what we've got to know. It comes right here, comes in this, like Trapper said, it's about that joy that comes from inside. That's all it is. Okay. It is only in the face-to-face -face relationship do we hear our name. Only in this face-to-face -face will we hear the name of the stone. Standing in the paradox of the magnet pull. The magnet in deep at your core, that core magnet, the Holy Spirit deep in your core, is pulling you to the Father. And it's the paradox of that other magnet, the anti Christ magnet. Remember? Remember that? The I am not. And if I am is Christ, then I am not is what? Anti. Opposite. Instead of. So Christ is the magnet in you and the anti and instead of Christ is the magnet out. The opposite magnet. One is pulling you to. The other was trying to make you turn from. That's exactly what's going on in your life. That's exactly what's going on. The paradox. All right. George McDonald. To the one who offers unto God the living their own self of sacrifice, to the God of the living, their own self of sacrifice, to the one that overcomes, the one who brings their individual life back to its source are those that receive the white stone. The white stone is your true identity. It does not come out of the book. This name is not recorded in any other place than on the heart of the Father and on the heart of the bearer of the white stone. This is where destiny meets destination and dwells there. Not only does each white stone bearer have an individual relationship with Abba, but each one has also a peculiar relationship with Abba. The bearer of the white stone is to Abba a peculiar being made after his own fashion. It's just like daisies. How many daisies are exactly alike? None. None. Everyone is individually, uniquely, Papa's up there saying, Boom, daisy. And you go, oh, that's so good. <gasps> Daddy, do another one. Do another one. Do it again. Boom, daisy. <laughs> oh, Daddy, do it again. Boom, daisy. Same way with every single human being. There are no two. Everyone is uniquely, individually, and individually a place in his heart and in his relationship. Peculiar. So I said, you are a peculiar people. Unique, individual. Nobody else can take your spot in this relationship. You walk away from this relationship. Nobody else fills that gap. That gap is there because that is your spot. Nobody else gets your spot in this relationship. That's why, I will come up on that quote later. There's <laughs> a quote that Jill wrote on our refrigerator of whiteboard. And she said, the world needs who you were created to be. That's exactly it. The world needs you. No one else can do you but you. In that relationship. Um, um, paradox, where, okay, the white stone, the heart, heart stone. Okay, this is where destiny is destiny. No, I already did that, right? Yes, okay, on the right hand side. Hebrews. Oh, let me just do this. Let me do this. We're going to close with this, actually. 
Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen them. I've seen them. This board's a mess. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, I can't do this. We'll just pretend, okay? We're gonna pretend like I know what I'm doing. So we'll pretend like this is, like this is a, a, an image of a person or something. But, what have you ever seen those, those statues? And they have all those little gems, I mean little tiny gems, all, all, the whole thing is covered in the little gems. You ever seen those? Mm -hmm. those, little, those little dolls, little statues, and those little white gems, or cold gems, or whatever. Just plastic, you can't see the statue because all of the gems cover it everywhere. That is the white stones that you cover the Father's heart with. What was that? So that those are the white stones that covers the Father's heart. Okay. All those little gems. So if we were to take one out, none slide over to fill that place. There is a hole in that spot because only one belongs there. That's why Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You can't be lost if you don't already have a place. You can't be lost if you have a place that you belong. Then He came to bring you back to your place. He came to bring you back into this relationship. To bring you back into fellowship. To bring you back to turn your face towards Him again. So that the transformation can happen and begin to change these I am nots and bring healing and health and wholeness back to your being. We think holy is spelled H-O-L-Y. Yeah. Holy oh. is spelled W-H-O-L-E-Y. That's holy because it's wholeness. And why is it wholeness? Because this spirit and this soul are in union. Yes. That makes it a whole being. When you're living just out of the I am nots and not out of the spirit, you're not whole. So to become holy, it's when both of them are working together in your life. Unity. Yeah. Unity. Union. Yeah. That's right. Let's see where I was. This other Hebrews. Oh, at Hebrews, yeah. Um. Okay, we'll go just a little bit further. We'll read Hebrews. Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. Uh, English Standard. For this is the covenant that I will make without... No, 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 we're going to stop. That's, that's a whole long other discussion. Right? <laughs> okay. I can tell where that one's going to go. Because as soon as I start reading, I go, oh yeah, that's another 10 minutes, 15 minutes. All right. Does anybody want to close out in prayer? I will. All right, Trapper. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for for this day that you've given us. I want to thank you for this fellowship that you, you've allowed us to have here in this room tonight. Lord. I want to thank you for bringing us all together and for extending my family. You know, I just, I, I want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for the, the powerful words you delivered to us tonight through your Holy Spirit, through our brother Michael tonight, Lord. And uh, I ask that you go with each and every one of the people in this room and the people listening online tonight and keep them safe and give them peace in their life, Lord, and lead them into their own ident identity. Yes. And the gracious Heavenly Father, we give all glory and thanks to you in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, shut this off. Yeah. Watch yourself. I got you. I got you. Right here. Don't go yeah. trip on